This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is one of America's most popular singers who first gained major international attention in 2015 when she won second prize in the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz International Vocals Competition. Since then, she's dazzled audiences around the world with her miraculous voice, interpretive ingenuity, and incredible versatility. Her first two highly acclaimed albums, Confessions and This Bitter Earth, earned her a well-deserved place in the upper echelon of modern jazz singers. And her brand new album, simply titled Veronica Swift, is nothing short of a revelation because she demonstrates once and for all that she is so much more than a jazz singer. Her voice and musical choices defy categorizing. On the new album, she explores not only jazz, but Broadway, opera, classical music, bossa nova, blues, industrial rock, and even funk. She describes her personal brand of versatile artistry as transgenre. Our guest has performed at some of the most prestigious venues in the world, and she's appeared with many great stars, including Wynton Marsalis, Chris Boddy, Benny Green, and Michael Feinstein. The critics are unanimous about this woman's magnificent vocal instrument. Downbeat Magazine described her as a woman of many voices who uses every one of them to inspire a dizzying kaleidoscope of moods. And the usually restrained Wall Street Journal said that our guest has a miraculous voice, musical ability and technique, as well as an innate gift for entertaining a crowd. I'm delighted to welcome the fabulous Veronica Swift to our show. Veronica, thank you so much for being here. Wow, what an introduction. <laughs> thank you, Harvey. It's good to be here. Thank you for having me. Veronica, you grew up immersed in the culture of jazz music and bebop. Your mother was the famous jazz singer and educator, Stephanie Nakassian. Your dad was the renowned bebop pianist, Hode O'Brien. Did you always know you'd have a career in music? Well, just like when you grow up speaking whatever your first language is, you know, music, a bebop culture it is a culture. Jazz is a culture. And in my family, I grew up immersed in that culture. So for me, it wasn't necessarily a choice per se, but it was just the environment and uh, through absorbing through osmosis, watching my parents do what they do so naturally that the natural next step, you know, to, to be involved with my parents' lives is to sing with them. So at nine years old, I started to get on stage and, you know, sing these very age appropriate tunes. And the career just kind of grew from there, which of course brings challenges in itself. But I'm very, you know, blessed to say that, yeah, I mean, it was just, I didn't know anything else. I grew up on the road and sleeping in the car and, and I slept in a base case once in Holland, which was fun. <laughs> so yeah. I read that you recorded your first album, Veronica's House of Jazz, at the age of nine. You recorded your second album called It's Great to Be Alive when you were 13. Are those albums still available? Yes, actually, I just uploaded them to Bandcamp. So people have searched me on Bandcamp, they can find them there and I signed them and send them out personally. Yeah, I still sell these too because it's important. One, they're great albums to introduce young listeners to jazz because they're very age appropriate, age friendly for children. But also because I, I learned something listening to my younger self. I didn't record these albums because I wanted, you know, I think I'm gonna be the next big thing in jazz or in music, so I'm gonna go out and try to, you know, it was just, I like to sing these songs. My mom thought it was a great idea to document this time in my life. And she was right to do that, because when I, as an older, more developed artist, go back and listen to my younger self, I learned so much about restraint and like, you know, we don't have like the inhibitions we have with the pressures of the world. We just kind of are singing purely from our souls, right? That's oh, yeah. It, it's a great piece of historical record, actually. Now, you recorded another album called Lonely Woman in 2015. Is that one available? That's on Bandcamp as well. Yes. And Lonely Woman and the two children records aren't on the digital platforms. So you have to uh, go either go on Bandcamp to find them or come to my gigs. I sell them. But the, the Lonely Woman is a special record because that's the last time I recorded with my father before he passed away. That was a at the end of my studies at University of Miami and, you know, just finishing out that age of 
that that stage of my life before I entered the the industry. While you were at the University of Miami, you composed a gothic rock opera about a homicidal nun. Is that right? It's it's a it's my take on Dante's Divine Comedy, and it centers around a nun who who is searching for faith. Basically, all of it is a metaphor for what I was going through at that time in my life. You know, I, I I'm an I'm an artist. I'm a storyteller and writer before I am a singer, actually, and and. I had I needed an outlet for all this pain. My father was passing away from cancer. I had my childhood home burnt down in a fire. We had to sell the farm. School, academia, when you're an artist is very difficult. And just lots of other things, relationship stuff in your tw young 20s is a tumultuous time. And I needed an outlet. Jazz music wasn't, that's my roots. And I love it from that perspective, but it wasn't an outlet for this pain and this anger and frustration. That's what rock and roll and goth rock did for me. So I recorded and had a band that was touring. And actually our manager was the guy who discovered Marilyn Manson. So it was kind of, that's how I got to meet Manson. It was amazing. So this gothic rock opera, are we ever going to get to see it? it well, I have, I have plans to maybe do it on off-Broadway or a stage production someday, because it really lends itself more to a stage production rather than a, a, an artistic project of mine. So once I've developed myself in the rock and roll scene, and the, you know, as I'm doing with records like this last one, then, and I develop my relationships in that world and in Broadway uh, circles as well, I would like to do this, yes. Okay, when that gets released, I'm going to be knocking <laughs> on your door asking you to come Aww. back. Thank you. <laughs> now, your first album on the Mac Avenue label, Confessions, won you the 2019 Jazz Times Readers Award for Best New Artist and Best Vocal Release. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Um, it seems like it's so long ago because so much has happened since then. But, you know, I sometimes forget. I mean, for anybody that you've interviewed before, too, and yourself, maybe we forget to look back and just appreciate some of the awards we've gotten, you know? <laughs> Well, I mean, it was your very first album on a major label. How did you go about choosing the songs for that album? Yes, yeah, so because it was a first kind of the first breakout, so to speak, album on the major label in the industry, I needed, I knew that strategically I needed to record an album that was more of like a, you know, a narrative based album with in terms of the thematic content, the songs and the arrangements. So I basically documented my journey up to there, all the songs relate to I don't sing a song unless it's something I've personally kind of experienced you know and all the songs on the album relate to very specific events in my life up to that point including you know graduating from Miami and then moving to New York which was always New York was always like a second home to me my home musically I grew up singing in New York with my parents so Birdland Jazz Club opened its arms to me as a young jazz singer at that time in 2017 and of course, Winton and Bodie, the ripple effect kind of happens if you get signed to a major jazz label and the jazz world took notice. So that first record is just that here I am. My name is Veronica Swift. Here's where I come from. I just think it's a magnificent album. And I, I've, I've always wanted to ask you this, Veronica, when you sing classic songs from the Great American Songbook that have been sung by some of the most iconic voices like Ella, Sarah Vaughan, others, how do you find a way to make those songs your own? And this is what I, I also teach students. And I talk, they, you know, a lot of students come to me like, well, how do I find my voice and make these songs my own? It's a very, it's the age old question, right? The first step is really you have to, well, from the singers and composers too, not just the singers and instrumentalists and the composers who wrote these songs, you have to dive into every aspect of their, their context of singing these and playing and writing these pieces. Because as, as musicians and artists, we are also historians, right? So we need to know who influenced Ella, you know, Connie Boswell. And that was one of her favorite singers. So digging into that lineage makes you, by proxy, a part of it. And, and you can really only sing these songs and find your own, find yourself in them when you've done that, done that work. And so after that, then, of course, you, you just listen and listen and listen immersing yourself in every recording ever made of these songs that you can find and that's another uh, job as uh, ours as historians and only then can you then find your own take because so many young singers they don't do that homework and you hear it there's there's a lack of depth in their singing that's like that x factor thing i think i think you're absolutely right there's no question that when we hear you sing there's a history there you have an old okay. soul because you've fused into your musical soul 
all of the recordings, all of the music that you've been listening to your whole life, and somehow you manage to create this sound that's kind of like an evolution of the singers that have come before you. It's really quite remarkable. I mean, that happens naturally, too. When you've done that work, when you've then applied it in uh, real time, when you've done gigs and you've, you're finding your band, I mean, who you play with and surround yourself with your peers, listening to these records with your peers, because collective listening is a lost art in the digital world, you know? And, and I think I just try to, you know, I try to promote that in my music. And I'm definitely, you know, I'm an old soul for sure. I definitely have my parents to thank for that, but... I don't, I don't think, um, a lot of people say, don't you wish you were, you know, born and around then? And I say, no, I'm definitely a product of my time, for sure. Well, yeah, and you sure showed it on this new album. But before that, I want to ask you about your album entitled This Bitter Earth, because it contains some very powerful songs. In How Lovely to Be a Woman, You Tackle Sexism. In He Hit Me, You Deal with Domestic Abuse. There's also songs about environmental issues, racism, xenophobia, the dangers of fake news. Do you consider yourself a political person as an artist? I'm a political person as a human being. Uh, as an artist, I feel it is my job to just, uh, I'm not here to answer questions, but I'm here to ask them. And so because of that, I, I don't consider myself a political artist. I'm just responding to the environment in a way that I feel for, for me as personally and for my fan base that I know as well, I, I want to connect and unify people rather than alienate people while still like asking the right questions, right? And sure, like I, I, my heroes are the ones that did this in a way that, that didn't, you know, take a side per se, but were able to still like move, move society forward. So. Like, for example, Michael Jackson's Earth Song is such a perfect example. He's asking the questions, you know, why are we doing this to ourselves? Not, we should be doing this, but what, asking the question, right? That's like an, in, when you're being interviewed, sometimes I get asked questions that I feel the first inclination is to be, act defensively, right? To, to answer the question in a defensive way. But then I say, to take a step back, and then I deflect with a question about them or about society as a whole. So that's really what this record, the This Bitter Earth album, there's a little bit of the personal touch in there too with, you know, it's not as personal and narrative wise as confessions, but with the uh, hints of domestic abuse and, and sexism that you see that that's how the record starts out and it gets more universal and, and broad and wide on a universal scale as the record progresses. So there was a Every record and show I do, there's always attention to the grand arcing, overarching uh, thematic landscape. I felt that This Bitter Earth really wasn't political. It was more thought-provoking. Yeah, that's how I looked at it, too. But I have to ask you, when you were recording that album, were you at a happy place in your life? Well, I think... I can speak for a lot of my artists, contemporaries, and hopefully my heroes when I say that a lot of times when you are an, an artist and someone who creates, whether that's through arrangement or like original music, which I do that as well, you're never fully in a happy place because you're, you're responding to a world and the world's always going to have negative aspects. If you look for that, there's also, you know, it's, we have to remind ourselves to look for the, the good things as well and look for what we're grateful for. So I try to present the full spectrum of that on a record. But at that, yeah, in that particular point in time, I mean, who's having an easy life at 24 years old? I mean, <laughs> especially as an artist in the industry today, it's, it's very difficult. And as a female, you know, I mean, I never once ever gave thought to being a female in the male dominated industry. I never experienced any kind of what I would presume to be a sexism. But then I saw, I started to see talking to my other female artist friends, which I never thought to do until they recorded that album. They all started, we all started to commiserate and see the little subtle things that happen and pop up in our lives. We go, oh, there's an example. And you're just, when because you're in it, you sometimes the blinders are on. You're, you're so focused on your trajectory and your career and your dreams and goals that you forget to see some of the, yeah, so the, the darker stuff. So that really was the record for like my responding to my environment in that way um, and wanting to take control of my life and that's what the new record is really it's like all right i've taken control of my life taken a step back assessed where i was and now moving forward with 
a sense of power, empowerment, you know? Well, and that's why I'm glad that your first two albums recorded as a child are there, because we do see the evolution. We hear the innocence, the naivete, the optimism in the child Veronica. And then we start to, to hear the edge, you know, there's anxieties, there's maturity, there's life experience. So let's talk about the new album. It's a, a long way to go, though. <laughs> well, that's for sure. But this new album is a significant departure from your first two albums with Mac Avenue Records because you're venturing into a fusion of jazz plus a whole lot of other genres. Tell me how you conceptualize this album. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't really, wouldn't call it a departure because there's still, it would be a departure if there was no jazz represented on the album. And that for me is impossible because it's so ingrained in my childhood, it's my roots. This record I want, I tell people to look at their, our, their, their life and their personality and just as I looked at this record as a tree, you know, there's very clearly the roots are there, the bebop, the jazz and the songbook, straight ahead stuff. And then there's the trunk of the tree, which is, you know, for your, your personal taste that you acquire a, apart from, you know, what, what your will has commanded you to seek out. So for me, that was as a young, young, young child, before I was ever singing professionally, I was obsessed with classical music, Baroque music and Stravinsky. And, and I had all these different like colors in my palette. And I had noticed I'm only using a select amount of colors. Of course, when you're in the industry, there's marketing and branding to consider. So I wanted to be strategic in my career. I had to start with confessions. This bit of earth gets a little broader and wider with the tastes. And now this one shows a full spectrum of who I am. And everyone's now, hopefully the way I've done it, uh, the audience at our live shows, they're prepared for it. They're ready for it and they want it because audience members don't just listen to one, you know, nobody just listens to one genre of music all their lives, you know? We, we seek out different genres to, to a, appeal to our different moods. And as an artist, I just can't present one mood. <laughs> it's impossible. Well, what we get is your full personality and you've created this term transgenre to describe your musical style. Can you explain that? Yeah, I, I mean, I didn't create anything, just, you know, it's, it's, it's been, the term made sense to me to use for multiple reasons, for social context as well, because I, as a, as a member of the LGBTQA plus community, I, I see not just with artists, but with, with human beings trying to find where they fit on a spectrum and that spectrum, and, and it fluctuates, it changes with, with age and with experience. And that because there's growing up, there's been such an emphasis on being this or that you're in this club or you're in that club. And I never fit in any club per se, you know, <laughs> so you just create your own for yourself and people find you when you do that. You know, the right people find you, the right tribe finds you. And so that, that's why the word trend genre made sense to me, obviously, like in, and then in France, like the word genre is, is the double word for style as well as gender. So that was pretty cool. But the concept has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. You know, Puccini technically was transgenre. He was mixing American folk music with with his bel canto opera uh, style with La Fachula del West or, or Turandot. Puccini's Turandot is Chinese folk music. You know, this is a concept that's been around. I, a lot of people harp on me like, oh, this she's not creating anything new. I'm, I'm not pretending to. I'm just adding to this lineage. I think you're doing it in a new way because you inject your own personality. Like, for example, the first song on the album is a brilliantly innovative rendition of I Am What I Am from the Broadway show La Cage aux Faux. Can I assume, Veronica, that by choosing to sing that song, you're making a statement about your own personal artistic freedom? Absolutely. That's, I mean, this, there's no clearer message in that way. That, that, that's why the album, what I, I bookended it, I Am What I Am, and then ending with Don't Run In My Parade, which are both very similar. You know, it, it's, it's like a, it's a way to bring back that theme and anchor it back in because that's the overarching theme of this record. And that's the way I could do it musically. And in, in terms of the arrangement, obviously the lyrics speak for themselves, but in terms of the arrangement, that introduces, the, of course, the roots and the bebop of my family and my history and where people know me from in my career past. And then introducing the Bach fugue that, uh, that I wrote, the, the, the fugue section that I wrote in there, that's inspired by my love of Baroque music at a young age. At four years old, I was singing that stuff. I love, love Bach. 
Well, just in case anybody watching this interview didn't get it, the Don't Rain on My Parade that Veronica just mentioned is the Barbra Streisand classic from Funny Girl, but it's done in a punk rock style. Where did that idea come from? Well, when, when I look at arranging songs, especially with this uh, transgenre concept, the, the main goal is to pay homage to the original, but with, with being able to let my own voice ring out in the way that the song still is authentic to me. And I needed to give the audience, um, since that is the last song on the album, and it's the bookended theme with the first song, I needed to give the audience a, a peek into kind of where we're headed. So the first album was where we come from where I come from. And that's the last song, so it's where we're going. And the reason why the punk arrangement is because when you just look at the lyrics, of take down all of the great, the, the great performance of Barbra Streisand, just take it down to the simple elements of the lyric and the melody. Don't tell me not to live. Just sit and putter. Life's candy and the sun's a ball of butter. Don't bring around a cloud to rain on my parade. I mean, that's a punk rock lyrics right there. Just the, the emotional context is like breeds punk rock to me and so of course then you have like the, if you know the arrangement for the listeners listening you know that the very famous Barbra Streisand version the orchestration has this dun 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 that's a very characteristic thing in punk rock and rock and roll that kind of dun 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 so then when that element is there the arrangement sort of writes itself have you ever considered doing an entire album of Broadway songs, but in your own transgenre style? Absolutely. I mean, I, I, Broadway would be an interesting one because it, it's just like with music in general. It spans over so much history and styles to take new Broadway ver songs and make them sound like they were written in like, you know, for, for a, a review in the 30s or something. That'd be an interesting project for sure. I love your rendition of the Duke Ellington classic, Do Nothing Till You Hear From Me. It has this kind of, maybe it's just me, but I get this Jimi Hendrix feel to that song. That's, that, was the, that was the goal. I always imagined uh, in my universe, and I'm sure that you know, people would die to hear this, uh, if, if Jimi Hendrix you know, had guested with the Duke Ellington Orchestra, I said, what would that sound like? Because so much of, so much of uh, this transgenre concept is imagining like alternate universes where these artists that are all our favorite artists can play together. And obviously that's not the universe we're in. So we have to bring that to the forefront as best as we can. And since Janis Joplin is also one of my heroes, I, I invoke her spirit in there as well. And um, so, yeah, if you listen to the arrangement, you have that Duke Ellington style horn section intro, but Jimi Hendrix answering and the recall and response, you know, just imagining if that had occurred in history, you know, and <laughs> be unstoppable. Well, one of the reasons I wanted to get you on our show to talk about this amazing new album is, for me, one of the real standout tracks, which is The Show Must Go On, which is a classic song from Queen, but you've given it an Afro-Cuban feel, and then you incorporate Nat King Cole's arrangement from Pagliacci. Where do you get these ideas, Veronica? Well, well, it is just how my brain works, but just when you listen to so much music, you know, it's all in there and this is just how it, it filters and it, I, I needed to find a way to put it together, like to fuse it in a non mashup way, because mashup is not the correct term for an arrangement like that. It's, it's connecting through line of what are the elements that are connected through each of these, kind of like a, a runners in a relay race. You know, every, if you look at the album as a whole, every song passes on a specific element that serves the arrangement and pays homage to the original. So for Show Must Go On, for example, the Pagliacci aria, Vesti la Juba, for those listening, gets the one that goes, Ridi Pagliaccio, you know, Pavarotti sang that, and the, the, the clown, and he's crying. So that song is about, in the lyrics, the translate, I did an English translation. It's all about getting up on that stage, whatever the real stage in life, getting on that stage, putting on your makeup, getting, you know, going to work, even if your life is falling apart, you know, as our job as artists and performers, we have to get on stage and perform. The show must go on. That's literally the last lyric of the aria. And so then I, I discovered a Nat and Cole arrangement of that aria and said, this is a perfect example of a transgenre take, you know, connecting the through line through history, but applying it to the era now in that moment. So Nat King Cole did an Afro-Cuban beat. That was the Nat King Cole arrangement. 
that he entitled Laugh Cool Clown. So then I just did an English translation, but I said, I want to take this one step further. The show must go on is how it makes sense to retitle this. And then, of course, boom, the Queen song. A Queen is my favorite band of all time, ever, and favorite artist, Freddie Mercury. So I had to, inst had to somehow figure out a way to put that in there as well. And I said, perfect example, in jazz, there's lots of tunes where you have the, the song and time, but there's an intro that's like a rubato verse for the singer and the pianist to kind of set up the thematic tone and harmonic tones of this tune. So I chose the first verse from Queen's The Show Must Go On to set up, and it just so happens that thematically they're about the same thing. So it wrote, it was just perfect example of this marriage of all these rock and roll, jazz, Afro-Cuban, and opera, Leon Cavallo opera. I mean, it couldn't have been a more perfect marriage of these. And this couldn't be a more perfect album, I got to tell you. There's a lot of references to classical music in the album. You've incorporated Chopin's Fantaisie Impromptu in I'm Always Chasing Rainbows. You've got Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata in your original composition in The Moonlight. And there's even some of Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 2 in that song. Your use of classical music, Veronica, is so innovative. It's so ingenious. You're pushing yourself creatively unlike any other artist I've ever heard of. And I think you're headed to the stratosphere. Well, thank you. I'm, I mean, it's just amazing that I get, you know, I, the more I perform this music live, the more I find, you know, because it's very easy to get as an artist with so much music and so much vocabulary to like put put it all in there, which it, it, this record is a bit of that. It's, it, it's definitely a uh, courageous album in that way. But, I, you know, there was, I had to shake up the, the perceptions of what kind of artist I was with this album. That's, I, I think I did that. But live, this, this music, it just speaks to people on a visceral level. Rachmaninoff Concerto number two or not, they, whether they know that reference or not. It's not like you have to know these references to get this music. You know, good music is good music. And that's what I really wanted to make that point with this album. Well, you certainly Everybody. made the point, and I think you have perhaps inadvertently introduced a younger audience to some of this classic music. I mean, the reference to Turandot in your song Severed Heads and your song Je veux vivre is from Romeo and Juliet, isn't it? Yep, Gounod, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, and, that, and that's performed with uh, one of the, that recording is with the Django All-Stars Band, Festival Band. They're a famous band from Paris, and uh, I perform with them at Birdland a few times in Carnegie Hall. They are literally the direct lineage of uh, the, the, the patriarch of that uh, family, that band was in Stefan Grappelli's band. So that's why lineage is so super important for me. The my lineage is bebop. And for them, they're the, the Django Reinhardt jazz music. So that was a perfect, another example of just a perfect fusing of these without sacrificing the integrity of the original piece. On this album, you sing in French and Portuguese. Was that a first for you? Nope, I grew up singing, uh, well, I, I sung a lot of Bossa Nova because Joe Beam is such an important part. His music is such, important part of the heritage of, of, of when you're a jazz musician and you're, you know, studying all this rich, rich music coming from different cultures. Of course, the bossa nova and the samba music is so important. Stan Getz having brought that, a lot of that in the forefront. But when it comes to singing in these other uh, languages, that, that comes from having sung in choirs, in classical choirs, and singing opera uh, throughout high, high school years. You know, my exposure to that was purely from my love of of that genre and wanting to dive into that, even though I wasn't going to be an opera singer and I knew that, it's important as artists, we're supposed to dive into these phases fully and immerse ourselves in, in this rich lineage. And so with, with opera, there's lots of, you know, and, and singing in choirs in school, there's lots of different exposure to different languages. We've sung in Chinese even <laughs> in school, so I have my school to thank for that. Yeah, you have an incredibly rich education. I, I know that the traditional world of mainstream jazz is not always welcoming of artists like you who go outside the box of the great American songbook as much as you have. What's been the public reaction to the new album? I can only speak for what I see in my shows. And people are starving for this kind of this kind of thing, especially people that, that want to hear multiple like that I find more often now than before because of uh, the access to literally any type of music from any era it right at your fingertips on your phones at Spotify you can listen to anything people follow where their taste takes them rather than being told what they like you know back in the day you just listen to the radio 
or your parents' records that were around. That was all you had access to. So instead of being told what to kind of listen to, and this is what everybody likes, listen to this. I mean, of course, there's still that in, in spades, but the fact of the matter is people can find their own taste now much more easily. Of course, digital streaming, all that brings its, its problems too. But what I will say is people want to hear all these genres in one place because it, it's so much more interesting too. And they, they're discovering things they never knew before. I mean, why do people come to hear shows in the first place or come to hear live music to have an immersive experience, a personal experience, right? And when you look at the lineups at these, these big festivals, when you see the lineups at these big festivals like Coachella, Lollapalooza, it's not just only these mainstream artists that you hear on the radio like Weekend and all that. It's also artists you've never heard of that are mixing genres like Kamasi Washington taking what jazz music is and, and reinventing it in his own way. You know, this is just the way that I naturally feel works for me and you have to be authentic to you and that's the message here. Yeah, and it's very refreshing. Now, Veronica, you're one of the busiest and most hardworking singers in America. You're almost constantly on tour, either in North America or Europe or Japan. Do you like life on the road? I that's all that's all I know. Uh, it's the it's what I how I grew up. And I know I, I talk about it a lot, but sometimes I I forget and other people forget that when I was about six years old, for example, I was sleeping I had my head in the car, in the back of the car with all the gear around, you know, resting my head as finding the one comfortable spot on the the amp or something like, you know, that's how I grew up. And and then I'd be sleeping in green rooms. And since I'm an only child with older parents, I was around older people and left to my own devices to entertain myself. And so it's just, it's what I know. And so, of course, like I, I welcome being home too. But, you know, it's important to have a balance and to find that. But since the only way artists really make money these days is from touring, that's never, hopefully for me, never going to stop. You're known for being such an electrifying performer in concert. Do you think you'll ever release a live album? I would love to. Actually, my, my dream is to record, a, to release a live album when, because like down the road, I want the world to know me as a songwriter too. That's not something I've because my music, my original music spans from, you know, the, the, this kind of like goth rock stuff we talked about to 1920s jazz. But really, my original music is is really steeped in the, uh, the Queen kind of school of like mixing these genres. But it's still rock and roll, glam rock. That is like me to a T. And I couldn't hide. I can't hide that on stage when you're singing this this stuff. It, it, I couldn't just stand there and sing. So I would love to do a live album of my original music down the road. Yeah, I can totally see that happening. I want to tell our viewers that you can learn more about Veronica Swift, buy her music and other merchandise, and see her concert tour schedule by going to her official website, veronicaswift.com. You can also follow her on Facebook and Instagram. And don't forget to subscribe to her YouTube channel, which you see now on your screen. So Veronica, have you got any upcoming projects that you're able to tell us about? Well, there's a lot. We still have to tour this last album. And so we're going to be going for Can the Canada and Europe and Japan and also, you know, in the United States, just spreading the message of, you know, what this takes a while for, uh, you know, it takes a long time to communicate the message of an album. And it's only been six months since the release. So we're going to continue touring it and we'll release another album with more originals, I think, on coming up. So you'll get to hear me more as a songwriter and hear my story in my own words. When you write songs, do you write for your voice, specifically for your voice? Yeah, and that's a very uh, interesting point to bring up because, you know, when it comes to American Songbook, these uh, composers were trying to get their songs bought, so they had to kind of write for all kinds of voices, whereas the songs that I sing in my set are now really like James Brown kind of tunes or Nine Inch Nails, where the artists write for themselves to sing these songs, right? So it's a very different way of singing. I definitely want to be able to write music that people can sing along to. So I keep in mind that to keep the range kind of in a um, comfortable place for men and women and people of all different type voice types. But yeah, I mean, I, I write purely from my own experience and my voice is very unique. And so I, I definitely want to write in a way that showcases that as well. But it's all about the story. That's the first, that's the first element that I think about. 
Well, you have a way of making people connect with you emotionally. You have a way of singing that makes the listener feel like you're singing just to them. That's certainly how I feel. It's been such a pleasure meeting you, Veronica, and having this chance to chat with you about your amazing talent and your career. I wish you the best of luck with the new album and everything you've got going on. Thank Thank you so much for taking the time to appear on our show. No, thank you so much. It really means the world that this this concept is speaking to people like you and and to, to have the platform to get to talk about it. I really appreciate you having me. It was our pleasure. Our guest has been the incomparable singer and recording artist, Veronica Swift. Her new self-titled album, Veronica Swift, is available on iTunes, Amazon, and on every major music streaming platform. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my programming director, Deborah Batsafin, my production assistant, Rosa Puzo, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 Network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Bye. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.